Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Leadership Lounge. It's great to have you joining us here. Uh, we're going to, we've got a fantastic pair of guests joining me today on a really uh, important topic for leaders. Uh, let me introduce my guest to you. Uh, I have uh, Trevor, Trevor Waldock. Uh, who is the founder of the Executive Coach. Uh, he's also served on the faculty of the School of Coaching, uh, founder of the Youth Compass Project and the former director and founder of Emerging Leaders Charity. Uh, we also have Jane Booth, um, who is the coaching and mentoring lead at the Guildhall Coaching Associates at the Guildhall School in London. And uh, Jane is also a clarinet player who's performed internationally since the 1980s. Uh, so a very talented lady uh, with both musical and with coaching too. Uh, so there's no power for guessing what our, our topic might be with, a, with our introduction of our guest, but let's find out a little bit more about our guest before we delve into the topic. So Trevor, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. There's a big long list of things that you've founded there uh, and uh, a key part of that has been your coaching, but yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing now. Yes, I mean, coaching is just, I guess, I say just, it's a theme really throughout everything in terms of a way of approaching everything. But um, I think I have a fundamental passion to see young people across the world um, realize their own potential and particularly young people in very vulnerable places in the world who get very little opportunity. So I think that that covers many of the things I have done and am doing at the moment. Yeah, fantastic. And the, the Compass Project, where where do you tend to support across the world? Is it particular countries or is it across the world? No, it's anyone. It's, uh, I've created this online platform where young people can become the, their own unique version of Nelson Mandela and it's, it's free online. And anyone who's got a smartphone anywhere in the world can access it for free. Yeah, fantastic. Great. And uh, Jane, uh, great to have you uh, return with us. So both Trevor and Jane are returnees to the Leadership Lounge uh, for this topic. So Jane, tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at the moment and what you're particularly passionate about. So at the Guildhall School, we have a coaching faculty. Um, a lot of our work is in training um, new coaches, whether that is at sort of foundation level where we're um, sharing coaching tools and techniques that people can use within their current workplace setting. And that might be people who have a teaching role, an advisory role, a mentoring role. It might be somebody who has a, a line management role, um, or it might be for somebody who wants to become an executive coach. And then we also have uh, EMCC accredited practitioner level training um, that takes people to the professional level uh, and, and starting their professional coaching journey. So that's a large part of our work, but we're also, um, just this week, we are launching a new project um, funded by City Bridge Trust. We have a six month uh, training that we're offering to 12 homelessness charities uh, to develop resilience in the homelessness sector, supporting people who work right across those organizations. That's something that's really exciting for our team at Guildhall. And personally, I'm involved in research around leadership in the orchestral sphere. Um, many artists train for decades to lead ensembles on stage. And we found that all of the training is actually focused around their artistic expression. And there's no training so far around their human, you know, person to person leadership skills. So we're working on that and seeing how we can support that sector to be to thrive and to be uh, really energized into the next the years ahead. That's fantastic. So uh, like for both Trevor and Jane, you've both got really exciting projects there about uh, developing, you know, the next generation for Jane, of, for you of uh, musicians. For Trevor, it's the next generation of Nelson Mandela's. Uh, it's fantastic to, to hear that. Um, so it's great to have you join me today. Um, our topic today, uh, for those joining us in the Leadership Lounge, is coaching that empowers. Uh, for me, I, I love the concept of coaching and the two of you have had significant impacts in my journey in terms of uh, for coaching and for leadership, um, which I will mention in a moment. Uh, so we're going to look at coaching, an absolutely crucial tool uh, for leaders. And for many, the first time you come across the word coach uh, was probably as a child on the sports field. Uh, for some, maybe it was someone who shouted from the side, but for the more fortunate ones, uh, it was someone who drew out from you your own understanding of your current performance and how you could develop it. 
And so nowadays we perhaps hear there are life coaches, business coaches, leadership coaches, executive coaches, instructional coaches, all sorts of adjectives now describe uh, the coach. Um, but we want to explore in the Leadership Lounge today what really is coaching? Why is it such an important part of the leader's toolbox uh, to empower people? And I have two people with me who have heavily influenced me in my coaching. Trevor started me on that journey, a leadership conversation where a few minutes he explained GROW, a simple acronym as a starting point for coaching, helping me explore goal, reality, options and way forward. Uh, Trevor, I don't know if you remember that. It was in a particular room. You literally got out, you know, the board and some yes. uh, pens and scribbled away at it. And uh, since then, every time I've met Trevor, he's skillfully asked questions to help me look at things more deeply. Um, and so as I began training, because I recognize the importance of this in leadership, I had the privilege of being taught further coaching skills by Jane, uh, where she modeled to me acute listening and thoughtful, reflective coaches' questionings that can open up a whole new way of thinking. So I'm honored uh, to be alongside some coaching heroes of mine. I don't know if they've known they've been described as that in their absence. I'm now describing it to all of you. So I'm really glad that you guys have just been able to give us a bit of time to help us explore this in the Leadership Lounge and to help our listeners. So in simple terms, let's just start in essence, uh, what is coaching? So you're my coaching gurus and heroes so that of course the answer will will be uh will be great for the listeners to hear so jane what about you what do you see in essence is coaching in essence a conversation and uh, a conversation between two people i mean coaching can also be in a group setting but i think we're talking about one-to-one -one coaching mm. and one person in that conversation brings their skill in asking powerful questions uh, and these quite questions might do a number of things. They might help to open the client up to new thinking. It might help open up new insights, uh, information that wasn't there before uh, about their situation. It might help clarify a situation, get more, uh, just really get down to the heart of it and maybe establish what's important in an issue so that the client can think about what the next steps might be and what they want to achieve where they want to go coaching is an art and it facilitates the learning growth and well-being of the client that's lovely thank you jane it's some some real richness there. and it just starts you to say with a with a conversation mm -hmm. uh, and it's important to remember it's an art so uh trevor what's your view on yeah, the essence not, of coaching not much bad really <laughs> uh, for me to me the, the heart of the conversation is where the learning is taking place uh, I think a coach is facilitating learning, and I think it um, it's about the realization of human potential, which is, uh, I'm not saying it's infinite, but it's vastly more than any of us will ever explore in our mm. lifetime. Mm. So given that there's always more to explore, the question is, are we going on learning? Um, and that could be learning in any dimension. So it could be learning a new skill, but it also might be learning to be in a new way. Uh, it might be about learning to have different conversations yourself. So any form of learning um, to, to me would have to sit in that. And I, you know, I'm with Jane, it is an art. And I, and I, I like the word facilitation, you know, that, that comes from the root to make easy. Mm. Uh, I think it was Einstein said that we should make things as simple or as easy as possible, but not simpler. Mm. Because learning involves some struggle. And our job is not to remove the necessary struggle of learning, but it is to remove the unnecessary struggle of learning. Um, so I think that's what we do. Yeah, so it's about that, that exploration with them. Uh, and as you're saying, it's all about learning and, and making that learning as manageable as possible, uh, but not to, because you're right, there is a wrestling in the learning, isn't it? There is a, a point sometimes as coaches when we ask a question, people will sit in that element of discomfort and that discomfort can equally be an important part of that learning because it's new thinking uh, and they won't know the answer straight away. Um, so how did you guys get into coaching? I'm sure you had different, I mean, I, I've told you how I got into it. It's, it's, it's your fault, you two. <laughs> uh, and, and thank you for taking me on that journey. But, but how, did you, how did you guys discover coaching, first of all, yourselves? either of you could chip in yeah take take turns 
Um, mine came through, I suppose I met coaches. I, I was studying how people change from my late teens. So I've always had a fascination since teenage as to why people do what they do and how people change. Hmm. So I was investing more and more down a therapeutic track and, and eventually, you know, qualified as a therapist along the journey. But I, so I think there was that, but it was also realizing that there were certain conversations that were available that were not in pure psychotherapy. Um, and meeting people within business context that I was working in. And uh, so really, I, uh, right at the beginning, it was a word that was better used, to be quite honest. I was working with um, Stephen Covey's foundation, Covey Leadership, uh, and the word was barely used. Um, but I, I felt it summed up the kind of conversations I wanted to be having, and I just <laughs> stuck it at the front of my advertising blurb and went for it. Mm. Great. Jane, what about you? How did you get into coaching? I sort of stumbled into it, Colin. And I was at the time leading one of the departments at the Guildhall School, that one of the performing departments. So I was, uh, um, I had a team of people who were teaching specialist area of music performance. Um, and there was an initiative to help us be more effective mentors with our students. And I joined that initiative because um, communication had always been important to me. And the training for the mentoring program, um, we f a number of us found that as well as helping us to have more effective conversations with our students, we were always have also having more effective conversations across professional relationships and across departments and across line management roles. And in a sense, we, we went back to the person initiating this and said, whatever this is, can we do more of it, please? Because it's really facilitating a new kind of conversation within our institution. And we feel this is incredibly valuable. So it, that kick-started um, a process of discovery. We discovered that it was really coaching with mentoring attached that we were engaging in. And we undertook professional qualifications um, and that snowballed into uh, a de the development of a faculty and now our, our wonderful programme, yeah. of which we're very proud, I have to say. So, so it's amazing. Uh, one little kind of uh, almost experiment and test then actually has become something quite significant. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've obviously been through the training with you. So I know the quality of the training that the Guildhall brings is, is fantastic. So it's quite amazing to think that all started from a, a little trial of, of how to kind of mentor and, and improve communication with students. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in one sense, Jane, you've started to describe how you began uh, your journey, of, I guess, of learning how to coach. We said earlier it was an, an art, but, but what is it that people can do to, to learn this art of, of coaching. So Jane, Trevor, have you got any views on, on, on maybe what you did and, and what you would suggest if people want to develop this art of coaching? Well, I, I think it's, it's about real experience, I think. I think you have to feel the power of coaching um, in the process of learning to be a coach yourself because it, it's that, um, you know, you talked about finding time and creating space and potentially just thinking about having more space in your own life. The, if you don't coach on a real issue, then we don't know the power that that can bring uh, to change lives. So, so it's important to work with real issues. It's important to experience being coached yourself, uh, learning the skills, practicing the skills, getting feedback. All of those things uh, feel really important to throw into the mix. And I suppose the final thing I'd say is, is that, that um, commitment to reflection on the work and to revisiting in your mind and in your thinking, what was going on in that session? What was I thinking as, as the session was progressing? What did I notice about my client? What did I, what can I remember now that I didn't notice at the time? What did I not pick up? And just, and, and what does that say about uh, what's going on? And what does that say about me? Reflection, it is 
I've discovered that reflection is perhaps the deepest uh, learning of all for me. Mm, yeah, I, I'm, and what I'm picking out there, Jane, is a real seriousness about our com- coaching conversations, isn't it? And you talked about being coached. I, I would say one of the, the things that's got me into coaching was when I was coached originally by a great coach, which Jane, you know, you know this lady, Jane Cook, and I saw firsthand the impact of her coaching. Um, it, it you make, makes you go, this is good. This coaching conversation is really helping me. So I want to use that for others too. And, and that power of reflection, being really serious about the conversations we have, reflecting, as you said, not just on the conversation, but on your, your emotions, your approach, as much as the person you're trying to support. So that's, that's really, really helpful. Trevor, what about you? How, how can we develop and learn this skill? Uh, what, what did you do and, and what would you recommend? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I've got much more to add. I thought it was a really excellent and thorough answer from Jane, to be honest. I mean, I, I was going to say you, you have to be coached. And I think it's true of all the helping professions is, um, you know, are you smoking what you're selling, really? Is it, <laughs> if, if, it, if it's as good as, as if it's as good as we say it is then why wouldn't we be getting it ourselves Hmm. so it it worries me in any situation where someone is trying to sell a skill that they're not receiving themselves so i would always start with that yeah great thank you and jane you you taught uh me the coach's mantra of unconditional positive regard that the person has within them the ability to find a way forward so how is that such a critical element of coaching this sense as a coach that you believe that the person has the answer kind of within within them how how important is that well earlier on in this conversation trevor mentioned um something being at the heart of the conversation and i was so struck by that comment because it really reminded me that the conversation is felt um as much as this is thought in fact it's probably felt more than it's thought. And when we encounter a client, when a, when a client encounters us, they, you know, we all have responses immediately. You know, the first sight, the first connection brings responses. And so it's really crucial that as a coach, we go into our conversation with the client with an openness, a curiosity, and without judgment, that, that we, we really effectively suspend any judgment that we might have around any aspect of what they look like or what they say or what they do. And it's so important that we do that because that creates the space within which work can take place. And if there is any sense from the coach that that judgment is present or that there's a response, you know, that some kind of response has been felt, however uh, subtly or however it can't really be explained by the client. But if the client picks something up in their heart um, about the coach, then something will be closed. They won't be able to um, open up fully into the conversation and, and bring the whole of themselves to that. So that will limit what can happen in the session. Mm. So unconditional positive regard is really a prerequisite for any uh, fruitful coaching conversation, in my view. Yeah. So it, it is about creating then this, the person feels safe. There's a sense of safety, isn't it? That, mm. that they b- believe the coach is for them. And that, that becomes the kind of seedbed in which things and ideas and possibilities can, can grow from. Um, and I guess we'll have people listening to this who, 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 who are coaches. We'll have people listening to this who are, who are leaders and are thinking, actually, maybe I could work more of a coaching conversation in. And I think this sense of unconditional positive regard is something that we should be having as leaders as much as, as coaches, isn't it? And when we create that environment, uh, we have that potential for those that, are, that we're working with and we're serving as leaders have that potential then for growth as well. Um, so re- a really key part of it. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if we just explore this this word empowerment as well. We've said we our topic today is coaching uh, to empower. Uh, and I know just before we started recording this, Jane, you said we need to we need to explore this word of of empower. Um, so Trevor, I wonder if you start with you. This 
I've titled it Coaching for Empowerment because I think that is what coaching does. But but what do you see empowerment is and and does it have any relationship with coaching? Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, So I've always, in simple terms, taken the word empowerment as as made up of two words. So it's the word, the prefix EM Mm. and then power. So the EM bit is to put into. And the power is comes from the word ability. Now, we've perverted a lot of the word power into things like domination and control. Well, it's not that, mm. because that doesn't empower. <laughs> it actually shuts someone down. Yeah. Um, but empower means that, that somehow we put power back into people. Is, is people have learned to believe that they can't. And what the coaching conversation is helping them do is actually learn to believe again that they can. And um, I, I suppose I've seen that in my work across different continents is I'm working with young people who are utterly hopeless hmm. and just think I'll never get out of poverty and, you know, no one's going to come and help me. And it's desperate. And part of it is helping them say, actually, you can. You have the potential. And by shifting your own mindset, you can begin to get yourself on the move again. Yeah. So I think that's the nature of empowerment for me is is are we helping put the power back into someone else and i think you can spot it in a coaching conversation uh, we, we used to talk when we were training coaches about the notion of over here and over there so over here is with me the coach over there is with the person i'm coaching so the, the question is you know who's doing all the work <laughs> see if the co- coach is doing all the work then the energy is over here. It's not over there. But my job, if I'm empowering, is to keep the work being done over there. Um, and, and it's the challenge when people say, oh, I couldn't do that, and I don't know what the answer, and what's the answer, and what do you think, is, you know, it's constantly reflecting back. So, well, you know, I could have some suggestions. I'm not sure they'd be helpful, but what do you think? Where, where mm. do you want to go? Mm. Where have you seen this work out? And helping people tap into that, I think, I've always found the neuroscience helpful on this is that the brain only holds between about three and seven blocks of information consciously at any one time. So when we say to someone, you know, what do you think? We should expect them to say, I don't know, Uh, but we shouldn't believe it. Mm. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, I think you just got to play the trick on the brain. So I I understand it feels like you don't know, but if you did know, what would you think? And (laughs) In nine and a half cases out of 10, people kind of pause for a minute and then they, they tap into that deeper part of their brain. Yeah. Where, because we've stored all this experience. You know, every day, every conversation, every situation, we are storing our observations of ourselves, of others, what's working, what isn't working. It's all being stored away. And I think our job as a coach is to help people to, to discover or rediscover um, what's in their own filing systems, to be honest. Mm, yeah, some of which they probably haven't even realised they've put in yes. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Jay, what about you and this word empowerment? How, how do you see it? Is there anything to add to Trevor's description there? I, I love Trevor's description. Thank you. I, I took a lot from that. Really, I did. Um, in, in When I looked the word up, um, there was uh, the word authorised came up. And and I found that really interesting. I think as I've been thinking about this topic, I was reminded of conversations I used to have in my old job with um, singing teachers. And singing teachers would always say that people need to be connected up. So so there there can be a a uh, a tendency for singers to think very much about this part. And actually they need to think about the support mechanism, where the energy comes from. And it's much deeper into the body. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of work about connecting everything up so that the whole body is engaged in the process. And, and I think this the empowerment is partly around um, reconnecting the self with our internal uh, value system, our internal strengths, mm. what we can already do, what's already available to us. What are the things that we used to love doing that we haven't done for a while? What are the things that we used to be drawn to that we haven't come to for a while? Because the external world um, has been pulling us in different directions. So how do we reconnect 
with the things that, that really matter to us on an individual level? What, what are my core values? And how do those core values help me to move to the place that I want to get to, help me discover what my future, my destiny can be with all of the resources that I have uh, within my own body at this moment in time. So, so there's something really about reconnecting with our own power, reconnecting with our own soul and our own sense of being. And, and some of that is also reconnecting with the physical powerhouse of the body, which is you know deep inside our bodies. I think when we feel emotions, when, when the body wants to give us information about something that's important, um, it gives us, it often gives us information in, in a part of our body, such as the abdomen or the throat, something about that. So reconnecting and finding out what the information is that we need to glean from that emotional response and then processing and developing and growing from there. Yeah, it's lovely. Uh, two fantastic full descriptions of the words empowerment and this sense that you're helping them rediscover, you, you know, you talked about their own power their own power pack they perhaps lost contact with and a reminder about their purpose and their values uh to empower them for them to to re-see it and and as trevor was saying sometimes they don't even realize it's there it's been deposited and and it's just to help them to look through that filing system to know what they do have access to to empower themselves in it so that's really helpful thank you um, if I was to break down coaching into some simple elements, and, and I, I realise I'm, I'm the least qualified here to do such a thing, but I'll, I'll be daring enough to suggest it for you to either tell me I've missed something important or to, to endorse it. But I, I think our role as a coach is, is as a guide. Now, again, there'll be some people listening to here that, that are, are leaders and want to use coaching, and there are some people that will be listening to this that will be coaches. Um, but in either way, I think it's important we see ourselves as a guide to empower them in, in making that decision for themselves. Um, I think there are perhaps four key elements. Listening to really understand uh, the situation, uh, then questioning them to help them get a full 360 degree view of the situation as much as they possibly can. Then using questions to help them consider their op options and any implications of them making that so they can make the most informed decision and then helping them to consider the way forward uh, and anything that might hinder this. Um, now, by all means, tell me I've missed some really key things, but I just wonder as we look at empowerment, are those the sorts of things that, that do help empower? And if so, why is that important to have those key elements for empowerment? Um, so yeah, listening to understand, questioning to help them to get a full view, questioning to consider options and implications, and then helping them consider their best way forward. Um, so Trevor, Jane, any, any view on that, on how these can help empower people? I, I think, personal view, I, I think it's worth looking at it at, uh, at three levels. So one is, I'm gonna call it structure, one is called skill, and the other I'm gonna call presence. So if I just explain those quickly. So, so for instance, you know, the questions that you've, you've outlined there are a perfect representation of something like the GROW model, and there are mm. different coaching models, whatever. But, but those models are simply how do you structure a conversation? They're not the heart of the conversation. They are simply, here's a roadmap, if you want a roadmap, that will get someone from, I haven't got a clue what to do, to go away with some kind of an outcome. So it's a, a structure. And then within that, there are the skills. So your questions, you know, the, the whole idea of, of listening and, and helping people understand are skills. And, and there are different levels of those skills. Uh, mm. We can talk more about those. So there are skills. But I think the third bit uh, where I think the transformation takes place in coaching is what I call presence. So my observation over the years is there were people out there that were quite functional coaches. Mm -hmm. um, so someone would come along and say, I've got a problem with my boss. What do I do? And you'd structure the conversation and you'd use a set of skills to help them work out, well, you could do this, you could do that, you could try that, and, you know, you come up with an action plan. And so that's a much more transactional level of conversation and absolutely useful at that level my not my problem my question around it is does the person change because that 
that's what we're looking for. Is real change taking place? And we use that word transformation means, am I fundamentally, as a result of this coaching session, going to approach life, management, relationship, whatever? Am I going to approach it differently now? That means something within me has got to shift. And that's a deeper issue. And I think that that level of empowerment only happens when the coach develops the ability to be truly present with their client. So, and I think um, Jane's very uh, elegantly kind of touched on like an example would be the use of the body. You know, that, uh, when someone comes for coaching, they don't just deposit their head in a chair <laughs> and have a chat and their body clears off for a cup of coffee with a body with a head on it. So it is an embodied experience being alive. But I think in Western culture, we have learned to ignore the body. And yet the body doesn't lie. The body is a source of intelligence. You know, the polyvagal nerve connects the body, the heart and the head. So it's all connected. And if so, if we're just focusing on what do you think, we're actually missing the, the heart of transformation. And so if as a coach, I'm going to truly be present with someone and what's going on in their body, then I have got to invest in myself. Have I learned to be with myself? Have I done some deep work with my own body, with my own emotions, my own processes? Because if I haven't, then I'm not gonna create this safe space and I'm not going to notice what's going on in the other person. So we won't see it. Um, so, yeah, I think those are the, the three bits that I would look at. Lovely. Thank you, Trevor. So, uh, Jane, what about yourself? What, what sort of the key parts for you then that create empowerment? Trevor's talked about noticing the whole body and, and us as coaches, making sure we're reflecting that and being comfortable with that as well. And that's where the transformation happens. What is it for you? I think it's congruence. So, so you know, where does the person want to, to go? And is that congruent with who they are? Is it congruent with um, the, the skills that, they've, that they have or the skills that they can acquire? Is it, um, how does it fit with their values? How does it fit with the things that um, give life to that person? The things that give, uh, bring fulfillment, satisfaction to that person? Um, I think, there's so much looking external, there's so much encouragement to look externally these days. You know, we, we know that Facebook is addictive and that, um, you know, looking for likes and looking for external validation is a dangerous journey for some people because it takes us sometimes away from our innate uh, gifts, our innate strengths, our innate values. And, and so being able to look um, at you know who we really are and we're, we're all wonderful unique individuals so drawing out the best of the individual and and giving breath and life and voice to that person is i think the way in which they will become most empowered to impact the world in whatever way they choose fantastic yeah great so, so this uh, the sense of empowering through a, really a tuning in, isn't it, to to them and giving them, giving them that time, giving that focus, watching out for as as Trevor said, watching out for the body as well, and, and really tuning into them uh, is absolutely key for empowerment. Is there anything else that, as coaches, we need to ensure happens? What are the ingredients for for the best coaching then, in addition to what we've talked about? There's something around um, the coach being the best person that they can be, uh, which creates space for the client to become, uh, to move towards becoming the best person that they can be. And I, I mean, it feels a bit woolly, but I think it's also, um, again, it, the word congruence is in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I think in a sense, it's not trying to be, you know the best coach is this and here's a model of the best coach but mm. the best coach uh, the best coach that i can be is is being the best person that i can be in that moment mm. and and that means as trevor has said taking care of my own needs my own psychological needs 
um, and ma making sure that I've processed what's going on for me um, so that I can come to the client, to, to my clients um, with a sort of clean, a clean space um, to work with them. You know, if I'm taking um, my distresses, my anxieties into that coaching room, then I'm not going to be the best coach mm. for that person. So it's, it's, it's incredibly important that I'm as aware of my own needs um, as I go to work, um, as well as being alert and, and in tune, as you said, Colin, to um, what's happening for the client. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go on. No, you go on, Trevor. No, I, well, I was just thinking. So, I mean, one thing I one thing I do with all my clients is, uh, and we talk about this at the beginning, and see, see whether they're happy to do that. But I invite a minute silence at the beginning of every session, every time. Basically, we we know that mindfulness sits at the heart of great leadership, and a lot of people rush into a session but also coaches rush into sessions. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, have I quietened my own inner voices? Have I just, you know, silenced myself? Am I being, am I coming present into this conversation? As, as, so I think to me, part of that is then trying to just model mindfulness as, as a way of being um, in a conversation. And, and then I would just come back to this issue of just how do I bring all of myself as a coach into this conversation? Because if there are bits of me that are not available to me, then they won't be available to them. There was always a great debate. And as a trained therapist, I, I understood it. But people said, oh, you know, coaching isn't therapy. Uh, and that coaches shouldn't verge into the world of trying to be therapists, which from a boundary point of view, at one level is absolutely correct. But what I observed is it then led to individual coaches, not, I don't think, and maybe this is Jane's word, congruence, not being, not acting with integrity, if you like, <laughs> within the conversation, not being really present. They were trying so hard not to be a therapist when someone who's a very senior leader is talking about something that's very personal. Uh, and you, you watch the coaches when we were training them kind of really try hard not to get involved in a personal conversation, which, of course, is communicating huge things to this client about we can't go there, we can't go there, we can't go there. And, and actually, in some cases, I, I think it can be quite damaging. Now, I don't think coaching is therapy, but I do think really good coaching is therapeutic. Because any relationship where one person is truly present with another, something happens. Some, you know, where that genuineness exists between two people. Peter Hawkins used to talk about creating a space for grace. That moment where two people are just with each other, with whatever the conversation is. When that happens, something is released. That's real, the power, if you like, the the real dynamic of transformational coaching. Um, and that requires that the coach has made friends of more and more parts of them, uh, of themselves. Um, so I, yes, I, I, I think that's. So there's this, there is this, it comes back to the same things you're saying about being truly present and, and finding that sense of congruence and, I think you're right. Sometimes as coaches, we can be trying to overthink and over worry. And it's just about being in that moment and truly and authentically listening, isn't it? Uh, mm. And that's where you say the empowerment comes. Anything to add to that, Jane? Uh, that was so eloquent. I'm, I'm spellbound. <laughs> well, I'm just sitting here spellbound with the two of you with some of the things that, that, that are coming out from this. So it's fantastic. I wonder if we just switch tacks then as, as we kind of uh, draw to the final, you know, towards the end of our, our session today and just think around, um, think around leaders uh, and, and leadership um, a, a little bit more. So there's a, there's a quote that's often banded about on the internet that leaders don't create followers, they create more leaders. And uh, this principle is something that I, I've developed in my leadership and it strikes me that empowerment is key to this. Um, 
And, and Trevor, I know you've you've done work obviously with emerging leaders and your current work with the Youth Compass. It's all about empowering others to see themselves as leading. Hmm. Um, so how how important as leaders is it for us to be empowering others? And, and uh, is it just about the coaching conversation that does that? What, what else comes into play? I, I think the coaching conversation, whether you call it coaching or not, but that quality of conversation is essential. Hmm. Otherwise, what you've got is, is a, a power either imbalance at best or abuse at worst. Hmm. Because you end up with a situation where I know you don't know. I've got the authorship and you don't have the authorship. That means I've got the pen. You don't have the pen. Um, and, you know, to overstate the case, to make the point, ultimately, then you are my slave. You know, you, because you come to work to, to deliver my thing. Uh, and you'll get some reward for that. You won't get as much reward as I'll get for that. But. You know, you've got all of these dynamics that, that are at work, which are against equality and empowerment. So I, to lead is a, about recognizing the full humanity of another and that we, we can't do this on our own. Um, and my fear that some of our reward systems are based on an individual doing it on their own. Um, so even if, if an organization is serious about empowerment, they have to shift their reward system. You know, we have to be rewarded, not you get rewarded. And, and I get a little bit less. We have to be rewarded because of what we did together. And then the leader is someone who is facilitating and, and yes, setting, uh, setting some direction, setting some momentum. And, but it, achieving it by enabling everybody to fully inhabit themselves their own potential and to bring and add into to that um, so coaching is essential in high performance cultures and, and even then i'm going to catch myself and say i don't even like the word performance i want to ban it <laughs> because even that word performance is based on you know an elite winner's model Whereas I think the real word is contribution. What we want, we don't want high performance. We want people's best contribution. We want people bringing most or all of themselves to contribute to the situation rather than the notion of performance where it's come to kind of race or competition against each other. So um, that's just a little hobby horse there. Yeah, <laughs> and it was great for that hobby horse to visit us there, Trevor. And um, I'm just listening to you. I wonder whether, you know, when you're trying to empower those that you're working with in, in leadership, uh, just hearing that, hearing what we've talked about already, I, th I, I think there's some vulnerability in this for the, for the leader that's leading. Uh, and if I'm thinking about this in terms of coaching, there, there's a vulnerability. Um, so Jane, is there is there is vulnerability important as part of that empowerment in a, in a coaching conversation, either as a as a pure coach or as a leader who's using coaching? Um, is vulnerability important for empowerment? I, I think you're right. I think it is. And and as you were you as you brought that that word in, Colin, um, what was already on my mind is when leadership holds fear, then we the organization gets into a difficult place. When, when fear as an emotion is driving um, choices, driving decisions, mm. we can be in a difficult place. And we're, we're living in a very complex and changing world at the moment. And, and I think that it's easy, you know, it, it's easy for people to be pulled into a sense of fear about what might happen in the future. And I think if we can face that fear and turn that into a vulnerability and uh, which allows an openness which allows for a conversation which says we are in new territory we are in a different place we haven't been in this place before and I really want to get the best out of everybody I want everybody to bring their best resources the best of themselves into the workplace then the job of the leader is to say we don't have all the answers I can't tell you everything that needs to be done but what can I do so that you can be at your best, so that all of us can succeed 
and make the best of the situation we have and help the organization move forward. Mm. So I think that vulnerability is, is really important to help us create the space for debate, for discussion, for shared um, ideas, for the sharing of ideas, and to allow everybody to lead with the strengths that they have and the strengths that they bring into the organization. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a sense, if you're coaching, you have to be vulnerable enough to say, I, I don't give the answer, I have to let them bring it to fruition. If you're leading, just as you've described there, I don't have the answers, we're in new territory. And that can be quite daunting for some leaders to feel, but if I don't have the answer, will they still see me as a leader? But it's incredibly empowering because the people that you're working with then have that opportunity to blossom and, and come to fruition. But but it's that strength as a leader to let go, isn't it? And to ask questions rather than to give answers uh, can be really key to it. Um, Trevor, anything more to add there on that whole question? I've just come back to this issue of coaching and learning. I mean, learning is a state of vulnerability, isn't it? Mm. Learning assumes I don't know. Mm. And the minute you assume you do know, then you've stopped learning and you've stopped growing. You, you are moving into atrophy in your life. So by definition, we, you know, the, it, I think life calls us to approach it vulnerably, uh, to say, look, I don't know. I want to learn here. What, did, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So that's brought us a nice kind of loop back round to where we kind of started it from today. And uh, our time has flown by already. Um, and so we're going to come in a moment to our final top tips, uh, just around our top tips for our listeners on, on coaching to empower. There are loads more questions we could have wrestled through, but we've, we've gone into some real depth, haven't we, about that importance for us as coaches being attuned, uh, a coaches being um, fostering this sense of vulnerability to explore and to learn. Um, but what are our top tips for anyone listening here today, just in terms of using coaching to empower, whether that's as a coach or whether that's as a leader using coaching? Uh, Jane, should we start with you? What are your, what's your top tip for our listeners? Listen before you speak. Excellent. That is just so clear and simple, isn't it? Listen before you speak. Yeah. And I always want to go listen and listen again and listen again. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Trevor, what about you? Yes, I'm similar, really. Is si silence the inner voice, your inner voice. Because if your inner voice is chatting, then you're not making space for someone else. So silence the inner voice. And, and the other thing I would always say to people is go and get a coach. <laughs> go and get one. Go and, st and not just say, well, I've done that, move on. But, you know, make it make it a lifetime habit that you are working with people as a learner mm. and then you know you won't forget i yeah. remember working with a bunch of coaches once just a quick aside is because we were so convinced about this we we chose to put ourselves i'm just thinking of jane and her music we chose to put ourselves in an uncomfortable learning situation just so we could stay with us so we uh, as a group of people hired some saxophonists and voice coaches and we spent half the day, and I mean, none of us could sing at all, but we spent half the day with voice coaches learning to sing together and the other half the day learning to play a saxophone, which none of us could do at the start of the day. And of course, it, it was great because it reminded us of what it means to be a learner. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Great way to end. Uh, Trevor, Jane, can I thank you so much for your wisdom, uh, your rich thoughts that you've shared with us in the Leadership Lounge uh, this month. Uh, thank you ever so much. Thank you listeners for tuning in. Uh, and we look forward to seeing and hearing from you again in our next month's Leadership Lounge. Uh, but just to end, Trevor, Jane, thank you ever so much for being with us this week. Mm -hmm.